Hello! So, I've been away for a few days, and now I'm back, I'm going to start recording videos again, obviously, and that's why this one's here. So, just before I went away, the Analog Baron came out from Black Square for Microsoft Flight Simulator, so I thought we might take it for a bit of a flight and have a play with some of the instrumentation, and at least try to operate the aeroplane a little bit more accurately than I have in the past. So if nothing else, it will stop me receiving essays in my email about how poorly I've flown the aeroplane. <laughs> Which are, you know, really great feedback. But um, yeah, it makes me aware that there are proper pilots watching and they will not be impressed by my usual antics to throw the aeroplane down on a runway or to ignore proper engine management uh, procedures. Anyway, so we are at Southend using the Pilot Plus scenery for Southend, which is really, really nice, and it's quite reasonably priced as well. So let's go and get this thing started up. Just before we do so, let's go and have a look at Navigraph and see where we are. So I'm going to leave the marker on just for a visual reference for anybody that might want to watch along and to make sense of this as we do it. So we are going to fly a left circuit at, um, at Southend. Uh, in the dark and we're going to make the weather worse in a moment just to make it a bit more interesting we're going to go and turn the rain on in the simulator as well so we'll be we using instruments we'll do a left circuit we'll fly out to the beginning of the ILS and then we'll come in using the instrument landing system to fly back in in appalling weather conditions on purpose just to see how things work really um, and as I say along the way we'll actually operate the airplane a little bit more correctly than we have in the past and do things a bit more by the book. Okay, so we need to get the aeroplane up and running to begin with. So we're going to turn the batteries on and it'd be nice to have some lights on in the cabin. So we turn on the, the panel lights and the floodlights. That's only the panel floodlights. The floodlights for the rest of the cockpit are overhead. And there's actually a few more instrument lights on the yoke. If you look on the right hand side of the yoke here, there's a map outside air temperature and compass light so you can see that little light came on over there also underneath the co-pilot yoke there are four knobs to control the brightness of the various they're just rare stats really variable resistors that will control the power to the various floodlights and instrument lights we're just going to leave everything as it is at the moment though okay so to get the engine started we go and check the fuel shut off valves and they are pointing forwards to the on position down there in the dark and we can go and then and turn on the beacon light to warn anybody outside we're about to start the engines we move the mixture levers to rich um, we can check here seven degrees in the cabin and outside air temperature it's actually quite warm it's just below 10 degrees outside centigrade so it's fine um Obviously, hopefully the cabin will... Well, actually, no, the blue light has come on over here because the cabin's still below 10 degrees centigrade. We'll see how that does once the engines are on. Uh, we may have to turn the heater on. In the Baron, the heater is actually... You can see it here. There's a blower and a heater. It's a, a fuel-powered heater in the nose of the aircraft. And if you've got um, failures on, the, the filters for that can fail, or the seals, and you can infect the cabin with carbon monoxide which is why over here sorry here it is there's a carbon monoxide monitor which is blinking green at the moment if that starts blinking red we're in trouble but i've got failures switched off as far as i'm aware so we shouldn't have any trouble i'm just pointing that out to you really okay so the beacon light is on we run the right fuel pump for a few seconds to pump fuel into the system Again, the, the length of time you need to run the fuel pump for is really dependent on air temperature as far as I understand. So the colder the day, the more trouble you're going to have, the more fuel pump you might need. But there's always the risk you can flood the engine. So we'll turn that switch back off. We'll crack the throttle open and we will turn the magneto for the right engine to start and hold it there for a second. And we have an engine. So we'll advance the throttle further to take the RPM out to 1000 RPM and we're waiting now for the temperature of the oil to increase. You can see the oil pressure has already come up. So it's interesting actually, we'll talk about this a bit later, but the, um, on, this is the turbo version of the Baron 
and in the turbo engines you don't really have to worry so much about manifold pressure apparently from reading the book because it has waste gates on it so any excess pressure that can't be used in the um, the turbos will be expelled anyway you do need to worry a little bit about the RPM so if you're running excessive RPM for long periods of time you can damage the engine but the most important one is to slid in the head temperature obviously if you overheat the cylinders then you can melt the engine also on landing when you come to a halt you need to run the engine down gently to bring its temperatures down if you just switch the engine straight off while it's still hot apparently you can warp the drive shafts anyway so we'll let that temperature come up you can see it's coming up nicely now and we'll go and start up the other engine so we run the fuel boost pump for a few seconds on the left engine wait for it to come up to speed so again this is all a judgment thing and in the real world you would know your aircraft and you would know your engines but we're guessing here based on the book so we turn off that fuel pump now and we can crack the engine crack the throttle open sorry turn the magnetos to both and then hold it on start and you can hear the engine turn over there and it's up and running so same deal we increased the engine to a thousand rpm now some of the things i'm not going to do because again it's very boring to sit and watch is you can typically you would take it up to say 1600 rpm and you'd start playing games with turning the left and right magnetos and watching the effect on the engines we're not going to bother with that just wanted to make you aware of that so now the engines are running we can turn the alternators on and obviously we're now generating electricity and then we can run the avionics so we turn the avionics on so you will notice actually just while we're waiting for the gps to boot up over here this instrument in the middle between the engines what it is indicating is the relative rpm of the propellers if i advance the left propeller it will start spinning left yeah if i advance the right propeller or so the right throttle it will start spinning right so that tells you how synchronized the propellers are now there is an automated system that can help you as well called prop sync down here that you can turn on when you're in cruise for example but it will stop the engines from you know um, phasing in and out of sync or sorry in and out of um, synchronization with each other okay so we're just waiting for the satellite to capture we're not actually going to use it we're going to turn on the transponder while we're here you can see the engines are in 100% good condition at the moment because we haven't got failures modelling so we're not going to be expecting anything to go wrong uh, GPS has fired up we're going to put it on the first page so we don't have to actually see anything on it because we're not really interested in it so again we're stuck at seven degrees in the cabin so let's go and turn that heater on just to see how that works so you turn the heater on and you turn the blower on for it so you can see we can put it on high and once it's on you've got pilot heat here so if we crack that open you'll see the temperatures already coming up looks nine degrees it's actually quite fierce the heater but it does burn fuel you have to keep that in mind okay so the cow flaps are open and we need to look at some lights so let's we're about to taxi so we'll go and put the taxi lights on and we'll taxi out to the runway Actually, while we're taxiing, we'll have the nav lights on as well, just to make people even more aware of us. So, parking brake off, flaps to take off position, although we don't need them just yet. Because we're already running at 1000 RPM, that's just enough to get the aircraft rolling. So, we'll do this from outside so you get to actually see the aeroplane. Did I turn the rain on? I haven't done it yet, have I? So we're going to make the weather significantly worse for ourselves by going for rain. Which will introduce mist. So we're, we're forcing ourselves to use the instruments that little bit more, which is always a good thing, I think. This is... Flying in these conditions in the simulator, it's an academic exercise essentially, isn't it? 
and it's uh, it's about using the simulator for its proper purpose which is practicing real world extreme situations without the danger so you can practice these things in a safe environment I love how the, the light of the port and starboard lights are reflected in the correct colour. It's fantastic. Okay, so runway ahead. We're just approaching runway 523. There we go, 0523. Obviously we have no ATC, so there's nobody telling us to hold short. We're going to roll straight out onto the runway. We're not anticipating any traffic. I'll say that, and an AI plane will come thundering in, won't it? So we're going to do an intersection takeoff. We don't need the full runway at South End for a little barren. Okay, so we'll just roll to a halt here on the runway. Let's get the rest of those lights on. So, strobe lights on. Landing lights on. Don't need ice lights. It's nice and warm outside. You can see where I pulled the throttles back to idle. The alternator warning lights came on there on the dash. They've now gone out. So I'm just easing the throttles forwards. So watching the airspeed increase. should have done this before we took off but I'm just going to spin the heading bug around to match our direction. Let's go and set the altitude pre-selector to 3,000 feet. Let's get the autopilot on. Now go to heading mode. So look at this wandering around with the wind pushing us. And we'll climb at 1,000 feet a minute up to 3,000 feet. That's that done. We need to arm this, don't we? There we go. So we're holding 1,000 feet a minute. Heading mode is on. We're climbing out. So let's have a look at these engine readings. So the RPM is just over the red line, which is what we don't want. So we're just going to ease the RPM just inside that red line. But we need to be careful with this aeroplane because we control the speed on this aeroplane by the RPM, not really by the throttles. So if you let this go in cruise, with it kind of trimmed out nicely, it will rip its way through 220 knots and start overspeeding the airframe. So we're coming up, we're looking for 3,000 feet on the altitude pre-selector, which we will be approaching. The beep you heard was us getting within 1,000 feet of it. You can see capture has come up on the, um, on the pre-selector, so it will level itself out in a moment. So when we finish climbing, we'll pull the flaps up as well. We'll do that now. So you'll see the vertical speed is being wound off gently by the autopilot. So we are going to now turn then to 90 degrees across the course we were on. And look on this map. We are just coming down here. We're turning 90 degrees. We'll fly out over the um, the Thames Estuary a little way. Actually, no, we're back over the the land here, aren't we? We're over the Thames right now. 
if I could just remove this out of the way, you can see where we are, look. So left, south end, we're just flying over the Thames, the Thames Estuary. I'll fly out towards Sheerness Docks, so then we'll turn out right, back out towards the ILS, which obviously we can see on the diagram here overlaid on the map, with never enough. So we can raise the cow flaps at this point. We've stopped our climbing. The RPM is within bounds. Notice I said about the speed. Look, look, it's still accelerating. You need to be so careful with this airplane. So the, the book is quite interesting. It says that if you just want it a bit quieter in the cabin and you're not in a hurry, just turn the RPM down. So again, we can use this as a reference to know if we've got the speed the same, and it's more or less the same. It's as good as you'd ever want it. So let's turn left again, another 90 degrees, and we'll go the reciprocal of our course from the takeoff. And let's go and tune in the ILS. So 111.35 and 233 degrees. So our course is slightly off, we'll do that there. So we wanted a 11135 on the nav radio. So 11135. Let's switch that to active. So this has come alive all of a sudden. And now we have distance measuring equipment measuring our distance to the apron of the runway. So I'm leaving landing lights on. Um, there's, there's all sorts of um, conventional wisdom about this, but typically commercial aircraft below 10,000 feet leave their landing lights on. So that's, you know, civil, like 737s, Airbuses, things like that. With GA aircraft, it's, you ask two different people, you'll get two different stories. But I'm gonna leave them. Okay, so I'm just going to check that temperature outside, 10 degrees, we probably don't need the pita heat, there's not too much risk of it. A bit freezing, happily flying along 3,000 feet. The weather is horrendous on the radar. So let's go and have a look and see where we are, we're just flying up this end, this, this direction up the route. We're going to fly across, then fly in and intercept the INS, which obviously we'll do in a moment. We can't see a thing, which is quite could be quite unnerving in the real world, couldn't it? But that's when you rely on your instruments. You don't guess. Just tipping over 200 knots there, 205 knots. Look around at the various gauges. Everything is modelled really nicely in the um, the Baron, the Black Square Baron, or Analog Baron, as many people refer to it. Really, it's good. seven and a half miles away from the ILS as far as this is reading. So if we go and look at Navigraph you can see that. Try to look from outside. Not really much to see is there. You can see the aeroplane lit up momentarily by the beacon there. fins underneath, the ventral fins on the aircraft are, are lit up by the various lights. So 
So we, we are cooking ourselves in the cabin at the moment, so I'm going to go and turn that heating down. <coughs> we'll turn the heater off. And it's dropping already, 31 degrees and coming down. So it's a bit sweaty in the cabin at the moment, but at least I've illustrated how the heating works. The little switch over here, by the way, it just switches out the radio kit, so you can have the GTN 750 if you want in the aircraft, or the um, Garmin, a combination of the 530 and the 430. So there we go, so another graph has just updated us. We'll fly back in towards the approach in a moment, and then you get to see how that works. It's fairly straightforward. There is a flight management computer down here that monitors the engines and the fuel burn rate and so you can click the step button to go through the various stats that it can give you about the engines. It's very good. So it gives you obviously the temperatures um, so you can get digital readouts of the temperatures to back up the, um, the gauges. Very good gallons per hour, obviously. It's very, very good. Okay, so we are showing we're 13 miles out, so we're going to make our turn. So let's go and grab the heading bug and fly back in towards the airfield now. turbulence out there, we're shaking around a little bit, but I guess that's just the wind and the rain, just affecting us a little bit, not too badly, not shaking as badly as it might. Okay, so you can see we're now coming back out, so it wants us at 3,000 feet on the flight plan to come in at this point on the approach, which we are aiming for. RPM a little bit to bleed some speed off. We'll have a play with approach mode when we get closer. So you can see at the moment we are below the glide slope, so I've come out too far on purpose really to ensure that we would be below the glide slope at this point. So what we're going to do now is fly and turn another 45 degrees so we are not going to intercept directly across the, um, the glide slope, sorry the localizer. So if we travel west we should have half a chance to see the needle sweep in and then we can align on it. Start seeing the needle move. Yep, here it comes. It's just overshot a tiny amount, but we can always just counter by steering across the line of the. Thing. 
glide slope. So, as long as we are in the ballpark and we can see the glide slope coming, we can go for approach mode. It's come up with glide slope. So the aircraft should, and this is a famous last words, it should start descending all on its own when we hit the glide slope. So watch the vertical speed and watch the symbology and up here. And you should see it all correspond and the aeroplane should start descending when it gets to the glide slope. We will obviously be ready to intervene if it doesn't. So watch the flight director, there it goes. Flight director has just dived to the right to put us, is chasing the needle now and it's descending on the glide slope. So we are eight and a half miles out and we are descending on the glide slope on the autopilot fully automatically. So now we just need to be mindful of our speed. So we can't obviously see a runway out in front of us yet. So we are going to start putting the RPM back. six miles to run. We're just bleeding that speed off down to 200 knots. Obviously as soon as the undercarriage comes out then the speed will fall off. So we'll do that fairly soon. We'll get down to about 180 before we drop the undercarriage. In fact I think that might be what the white marker is here for. Keep half, half an eye outside because it's quite pretty to watch the the um, the runway coming. Using as much drag as I would have thought it would have. I'm starting to worry about where the runway is. We should see it any moment. And here it comes. close the trees were. All my word. So off of the autopilot. Just adjusting for the wind slightly. first exit to the left back towards the buildings and we can enjoy the puddles on the way back <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed that so remember what they said in the book we can't just shut the engine down immediately we have to sit and wait and watch the temperatures come down Hopefully on a nice cold night with water hitting the aeroplane, you would hope it might help that. But we've got a little bit of a taxi in anyway. I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it in the dark. There's actually a Vulcan parked over here. At the edge of the airfield. It's just over here in the darkness, I think. 
yeah, you can just see its silhouette there. Let's see if we can see it from outside. See it there? It's a Vulcan V bomber from the 1960s. Nuclear bomber. Okay, so we need to turn some lights off. So, landing lights off. Strobes off. And we'll probably be good to go. Should we park next to the. Now, should we go back to where we started from? That might be a nice place to finish, actually. isn't it how the AI helpers just have some, some sort of bizarre death wish okay so we're not going to cut the engine just yet mate because we've got to wait and wait for the temperatures to come down which I think, actually, they pretty much have done. So we're good. So to cut the engines, we just need to pull the mixtures back. And they will roll to a stop. And then we can go around the cockpit, turning things off again. So taxi light can come off. We'll leave the panel lights on for the moment. And we'll turn the avionics master switch back off. The alternators can come off now, obviously. So the last thing we will do, oh, we'll go and turn off those lights. Turn off the main cabin lights overhead. And finally, we will go and turn off those panel lights. That will give us the torch back and then the battery light can come off. And we're good to go. So hopefully you enjoyed that. We got back in one piece with the Baron in the dark and the rain and you got to see just a, you know, a sample of flying it a little bit more correctly and operating the engines as the book tells you to. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there and I'll see you again soon.